Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Stephen Small, the director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. I'm also a professor in the Department of African Diaspora Studies, where I've been a professor since 1995. I'm pleased to welcome you today to our in-person audience and to those who are online remotely for our annual Social Change Awards Ceremony. I'm speaking to you today from Berkeley, the city of Berkeley, which is the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chechenyo Ohlone. The land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with the university values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native people. By offering this land acknowledgement, I affirm indigenous sovereignty and our commitment to hold UC Berkeley more accountable to the needs of Native American people. I'd like to begin by thanking several people. First, the Yamashita family for endow endowing the Foundations for Change Prize. I'd like to thank Professor David Kerr for endowing the Kids First Prize. I'd like to thank members of the Selection Committee for both prizes. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues and friends, Deborah Lustig and Maxwell van der Varke for organizing this award ceremony. Now, I know it's been a difficult and challenging semester, but we do have a full and inspiring program today, and I hope that you look forward to it and enjoy it. Let me just tell you what's coming up next. First, we will award the Kids First Prize and the Honorable Mention. Then we'll award the Foundations for Change Prize and Honorable Mention. And finally, we'll have time for discussion with all of our guests today. Those of you who are joining us via Zoom, please use the Q&A feature uh, to pose your questions. And those who are here present, we'll invite you to pose your questions by raising your hand, okay? Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor David Kirk, who is joining us via Zoom. Well, let me first say, David Kirk is Professor of the Graduate School here at, at Berkeley. He has been a faculty member of the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley since 1971. In his 17 books, and if, excuse me, in his 17 books and even larger number of articles in both the popular press and scholarly journals, he's tackled some of America's biggest social problems, including affordable housing, access to health, gender discrimination, and AIDS. Throughout his career, his main focus has been on education and children's policy from cradle to college to career. He'll tell you more about why he established the prize, but let me first say we are honored that he chose to establish the prize at the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. Welcome, Professor Kip. Professor Kip is unable to join us today. Okay, well, we're very sorry about that. He was with us last year. You know, these things arise. People can't always make it here for a variety of reasons. Uh, in his absence, let me say this. The Kids First Prize, David L. Kip Prize, rewards UC Berkeley undergraduate students who are engaged in new or ongoing work that demonstrates a commitment, whether in education or in other arenas, a dedication and a commitment to creating a better future for children and youth. The prize recognizes students who have developed innovative strategies to increase opportunities for children and youth, as well as recognizing students who've demonstrated a commitment to improving the future of children and youth. The intent of the prize is to shine a light on a student whose work has largely gone unrecognized. This year, it's our pleasure to award the prize to Jordan Webb, a political science here, a political science major here at UC Berkeley. Throughout her years at Berkeley and her work with the League of uh, Women Voters, wait a minute, throughout her years at Berkeley, and work with the League of Women Voters, Long Beach City Council, and the Biden presidential campaign, Jordan has been dedicated to serving multicultural communities. Jordan works to improve current mechanisms and processes that ensure that all voices are heard. 
particularly young people from marginalized communities. This concern prompted Jordan to launch the Long Beach City Vote, a nonpartisan campaign for youth voting, with the goal of providing underrepresented and under-resourced youth with the educational resources and the tools that they need to make their voices heard. Following her graduation on Saturday, Jordan will continue with this work and pilot a civics education course for high students in Long Beach. Welcome, Jordan, and congratulations. Welcome. Thank you so much, Professor Small, for that warm introduction. I feel deeply honored to receive this prize and to be in the company of such a distinguished group of leaders and change makers. Transforming this idea into real output required a great deal of support. So I'd also like to extend a huge thank you to everyone who has been a part of the Long Beach City Votes journey and played an instrumental role. I wholeheartedly thank you and express my sincerest gratitude. With that said, I'd like to now share a few of my work. As a political science major who has studied institutional governance, I am a firm believer in the influence and impact that people can have in improving the quality of democratic governance. And so pretty early on, I became preoccupied with wanting to improve upon current mechanisms and systems to ensure that all voices are heard. So I quickly found myself community organizing and helping to coordinate some of the Get Out the Vote initiatives on the Biden presidential campaign. So I enjoyed my time on the campaign. I'd also become dismayed by the ways in which organizations, particularly political parties and formal political campaigns had lost their institutional capacity to educate and motivate marginalized voices, particularly young people. To my surprise, I'd become exposed to a much larger issue or what I call the disappointing truths about youth voting, like how the United States has one of the lowest voter turnouts in the world or how there's a 60% gap that exists between young adults and older citizens. Or even worse, the gap between young people's political intentions, which is around the high 70s, mid 80s, are actually in reality, or in the 30s. So with this concern, I become exposed to the ways in which the youth voter turnout has problems um, and I saw firsthand what those problems were. So the first I realized was the unequal access to quality civic learning opportunities. Um, typically young people, especially young people of color, um, traditionally have less opportunities in schools or community settings to familiarize themselves with the voting process. Second, there are complex and unclear voting registration rules that really prevent young people from actually realizing their political intentions. And third, there is a misalignment between voter resources and outcome, um, typically because young, most people are concerned with young voter turnout, uh, but it's really difficult understanding what voter resources provide young people um, and what those voter resources are. So with this concern, I, in the second semester of my sophomore year, um, I decided to make one of the most unconventional leaps of my undergraduate career finish out my employment on the Biden presidential campaign and use my free time in between my classes and extracurriculars to launch a campaign for youth voter education. And my mission was simple, to mobilize young leaders in the effort to provide underrepresented, and under-resourced youth with the tools and resources they need to make their voices heard. However, realizing that I needed a young hub of students and a place to educate young people, I returned to a local high school a place where I could tap into the expertise of community and faculty members, um, experts who had been working with students. And my strategy was simple. I wanted to meet the moment of demand. I wanted to close the gap between high interest of young people wanting to vote, but low institutional capacity of organizations and even schools and faculty members who didn't really know how to provide that education. Um, second, I wanted to evolve to be socially and political, politically responsive finding ways to keep evolving and keep advancing educational content and the resources that youth are being provided um, was really important to make sure that the content was relevant, especially with a topic like civics education where the political climate is changing so much. It's really important that you have resources 
that are provided, but also resources that are accurate and currently up to date. Um, and our third strategy was to scale the educational content and outreach. So that means continuing reaching more audiences and young people um, from school to school, from classroom to classroom. And the way that this campaign was executed was typically through working uh, or combining the campaign and community-based research strategies that I had learned from the Biden campaign and tweaking them with the help of AP government teachers and faculty members to produce high quality educational content. Um, that way we could actually give young people uh, voting messages and resources that they needed, but we also knew exactly what messages would work. And here you can see a, um, are just a couple examples of the promotional work that we used. Um, unfortunately in 2020 COVID hit, so that also meant that we had to break away from the classroom and turn into a digital voting strategy. Um, so meaning using digital methods and social media um, to launch a campaign for voter education. And so these pictures are some of the infographics that we used. Um, in terms of the content, I'm sure you're wondering what content we used, but these are just some examples of the type of lessons and um, content that we used to actually get um, young people to turn out and to teach them exactly how to realize their political intentions. Um, and this spans voter registration, everything you need to know about returning your ballot, where you go to drop off your vote by mail ballot, um, especially that was a new territory um, for you know voting, not in person, uh, but um, through mail-in ballots. In terms of our outcomes and impact, um, we helped students make their voices heard and we equipped students with the skills they needed to build a better tomorrow. And thirdly, there, um, we saw a greater boost in political participation and other civic duties. Um, you know, it started as a concentrated movement at uh, McBride High School ended up turning into a movement where students from 11 different high schools started engaging with their content online. Um, and also we expanded our teams, um, our academic faculty, more teachers wanted to get involved in the school. Um, it even spanned across topics. We moved out of our government classrooms and had Spanish teachers and even English teachers and math teachers using better educational content with their regular core curriculum um, to help young people turn out. Um, and also structurally, we were able to expand our team um, to 12. We were able to secure strategic partnerships and endorsements from college campuses, organizations, um, and even made other partnerships with community groups like um, Reclaim Our Vote is also working with the North Carolina ACLU um, and the League of Women Voters as well, and Operation Jumpstart. So thank you. Congratulations, uh, Jordan, for your very well-deserved uh, award and for your success. And of course, we wish you continued success uh, in your life and in your career and with your family. Now, it's my pleasure to announce that honorable mention for the Clare Prize goes to Yadira Hernandez Figueroa, who is also a political science major, but also political science and ethnic studies major here at Cal. They were born, in, born and raised in Merced, in the heart of California's Central Valley. Growing up in a rural community with an equitable access to higher education deeply shaped their commitment towards expanding educational accessibility. As the FEMTOR Affairs Director at Central Valley Scholars, they created and developed a 10-month FEMTORship program where students going through the undergraduate application process are paired with folks from the Central Valley to, to serve as their fem, fem tours and provide personalized support. Yudira's personal experiences greatly influenced how the program has become a community for students to be met with patience and encouragement as they face the difficulty of pursuing higher education as first generation, undocumented, and black students from the Central Valley. After graduating on Saturday, Yadira plans to continue working for educational equity and will pursue a master's degree in public policy. Welcome, Yadira. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start off by saying thank you to everyone who made tonight possible. A special thanks to the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues and Professor David Kurt for their work in establishing the Kids First Prize. Um, and for reading all the incredible applications 
and granting special recognition to Central Valley scholars and myself and the work that we've been involved with for the past three years. I worked with Central Valley scholars began a little over two years ago when it provided me a space to build community, learn and grow alongside other like-minded folks from similar backgrounds as my own. Central Valley Scholars is a nonprofit organization seeking to empower Central Valley students by directly providing resources, guidance, and support in order to make their educational dreams a reality. At the core was a desire to take action in regards to the opportunity gap and lack of access to higher education that runs rampant in the Central Valley, home to California's 21st Congressional District, also known as the nation's least educated congressional, congressional district. As the organiz organization began to grow and the year continued, details of what the mentoring program would encompass, how many students we would serve, and its remote nature were exacerbated by the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in March of 2020. The pandemic magnified barriers that were already present for students trying to go to college, such as the lack of internet access, support, and resources to strengthen their applications and reach their fullest potential. It was evident that such mentorship program was needed and its development was entirely founded on the premise that students would be mentored at their own pace and that resource sharing through both laptops and scholarships would be essential. Thus, the development of the mentorship program was a product of much personal reflection, emotional labor, and love that stemmed from a mutual understanding as a Central Valley student myself about the obstacles and the lack of resources that we face on our journeys to higher education. Through this reflection and deep understanding of the nuances embedded within these institutions of higher education, the program emerged as a virtual community for students to be met with compassion, patience, and encouragement as they face the difficulty of attending higher education. Central to our mission was creating an inclusive and safe space for all students, which inspired the decision to use the mentor in replacement of the traditional mentor. This change reflected the power of language and titles, as well as our ongoing commitment to non-male marginalized genders. Our main way to assess the impact of our program on our participants was through their success with college applications. Collectively, our first cohort of 18 students applied and were accepted to over 26 colleges and universities, including UC Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara, Fresno State, Pepperdine University, Swarthmore College, and Yale University. Students that participate in our program also walked away with sincere interpersonal relationships, a sense of self-development, and joined a growing community of Central Valley students that were, where, that were there to support one another, both personally and professionally. My position as a Mentor Affairs Director has served as a space for professional and personal development for myself. This program has entirely changed the course of my career and has given me the confidence and platform to dream of bigger things for both the program and myself. I move forward inspired by the love, support, and affirmation given to me not only by the process of developing such a program, but also by the program participants who have taught me much more than I could ever express. Lastly, I'd like to dedicate this recognition to my older brother, Andres. He unexpectedly passed away early in March of this year. In many ways, my work and dedication was always inspired by him. As an early education teacher himself and an art specialist, he made his, this world a brighter, more colorful and creative space for young kids in his own community of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He remains my biggest inspiration and a compass towards walking towards new beginnings and better, brighter futures for the youth of our communities, our families and ourselves. Thank you. Why, thank you for that. Aren't they both fantastic public speakers? I wish I was able to speak that way. Okay. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. Okay, so to continue, congratulations to both of you. Congratulations on graduating from the number one public university in the nation, in the world, in the galaxy, and in the universe, and perhaps the multiverse. We don't know. We don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay, we look forward to hearing more about what you do next, and we do hope that you'll keep in touch and let us know. Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Yamashita, son of Thomas Yamashita, and Bob, who I know him as Bob, was one of my very first friends when I stepped off a plane in August 1984 to begin a PhD in sociology here at Berkeley. 
He's a close friend. He looked after me. He taught me everything I know, except how to speak with an American accent. But I didn't need that. He taught me how to navigate the institution, how to navigate. And I'd like to just take a moment to embarrass him. He's a good guy. He's a very successful. He's a father. He's a family member. And he continues, although he's retired, he continues to commit and, and be dedicated to uplifting uh, communities. Okay. Bob is Professor Emeritus of Interdisciplinary Studies in Science and Society at Cal State San Marcos. And while he's retired, he still continues to do research on effective community health promotion and screening. He received his PhD in sociology from UC Berkeley, and he was a graduate student trainee at the Institute for the Study of Social Change, which became the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. Okay, but we're not here to talk about Bob. We're here to talk about his father and the award. And so I welcome Bob to take the floor to do so. Well, we have to first start with the congratulations to the undergraduates. It's like, you guys are doing great work and getting out there and making a difference. Uh, in terms of this award, it was actually a uh, former director of the Institute, Rachel Moran, who, you know, when my dad passed, you know, people were saying, what should we do for him? And we said, why don't you send money to UC Berkeley and the Institute? So this money showed up and I was like, what are we going to do with this? And uh, so in terms of, you know, we really had to step back and think about, here's what my dad did. My dad was actually worked in Hong Kong. He was the the company sent their Asian to Asia would be my version of it, but and he was in Hong Kong from 1958 until the handover. And when you think about what Hong Kong is or was, you know, you imagine the waterfront. He had nothing to do with that, but he built all the infrastructure which allowed Hong Kong to become Hong Kong. And so was trying to how do you then begin to recognize that from a standpoint of social change? And it was really looking for the people who did the work of social change, but were generally unrecognized. Because the stars will always be stars and they'll always get you know, more kudos, but there's usually a lot of people that are doing the work behind the star. And so it was how do we actually begin to recognize the workers of change? And more importantly, it's not just doing the work of change, but the people who can then translate that work into something more meaningful, which is the academic translation. And so we're, you know, the award really is trying to identify really unique type of characters. And it's actually pretty difficult and really hard to, you know, for both the from an applicant pool, but also then reading, working through all the applicant pool and trying to figure out who's really doing the work of change, because there's a lot of people who say, I do change. And then you actually look at what they do, and it's like, not really, you know. And so it's really trying to figure out that type of person who isn't in there, for, who isn't doing the work for the glory, but they're really focused and doing the nuts and bolts stuff. And so that, you know, that's the basis behind the prize. And uh, we'll give it back to Steve. You want to share a few more words about your dad? <laughs> oh yeah, no, my dad was he was. Uh, a fifth year senior at Cal in 1941, which meant that he graduated from the University of Nebraska because of internment. And, uh, you know, there's another person, who, my cousin, who's actually on the award committee. You know, he, you know, Don Tamaki, and he started the Asian Law Caucus. He was also the second chair on uh, the Koromatsu case, which is the whole intern internment case and the, and the effort to get reparations for that. And he's currently on the, the California Commission for Reparations. Yeah, yeah, yeah and he's, he's now, he's doing a lot of really interesting work. Good. So. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks to Bob for sharing those words about the, the inspiration for the prize about your father. And your, and your family in founding the prize. Yeah, and I'd just like to say that we at the Institute are deeply grateful uh, for the opportunity to be able to uh, organize this ceremony each year and to make this prize, uh, uh, to offer the prize to 
some of uh, Berkeley's most outstanding students. Now, let me say something about the prize itself and the recipient. The Master Prize uses a nomination system, and today's winner, jo uh, Jason, Dr. Jason O'Connor, was nominated by his colleague, Rudolfo Mendoza Denton, who is professor of psychology here at Cal. Jason O'Connor is assistant professor of psychology at UC Berkeley. He works to mitigate the effects of stereotypes in education and criminal justice. He both conducts research and then works to apply his findings to create social change. One strand of his research focuses on teacher-student relationships and race disparities in disciplinary action. He also designs and tests large-scale psychological interventions for school administrators, jails, prisons, and court departments, such as probation and parole officers. His large-scale interventions target the mindsets of people in positions of power in order to shift the way that they interact with the individuals under their supervision. One of his latest interventions significantly cut suspension rates for a sample of over 13,000 students. In his letter of nomination, Professor Mendoza Denton wrote, and I quote, such interventions have required multiple bureaucratic hurdles, uh, including approval from state educational agencies, local district officials, teachers, and students. He continues, the amount of work and time required to build trust in, in communities, to gain access to testing sites, and to run studies in such a way that it does that they don't overburden, overwhelm teachers, make Professor Okanofwa's achievements all the more impressive. And so now let's hear directly from Professor Okanofwa himself. Welcome. Thank you, Professor Small. Thank you, Bob. Thank you to the amazing work that you undergrads are already doing. I was not that far along where I was where you are. Please keep up the good work. Um, thank you to the Latinx Research Center, uh, University of California, Berkeley and ISI for this opportunity uh, and this honor. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the people that support me all the time, my family over there in the back row, the kids whispering in the background. <laughs> um, so I'll start with a, I won't keep you all too long, I'm aware that there's a Warriors game tonight. Um, I'll start with a brief story of just where all of this work came from. And I think that the actual work itself makes more sense that way. Uh, I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, the same place where MLK was assassinated um, and considered one of the most dangerous cities in the country. Um, I have two older brothers and due to uh, the breakup of our parents. Uh, we ended up spending a lot of time taking care of ourselves uh, and fending for ourselves, uh, which really meant them protecting me uh, in the variety of neighborhoods that we went through at the time. Um, we got kicked out of, I believe, seven schools. Anytime that one of us would get kicked out of school, our parents would have all of us go to the next school. I believe that was the beginning of me wanting to be a social scientist, was seeing the different setups and, and, and demographics of all of those different schools on the different parts of town. Um, and I would reflect on that with my brothers because then there was that uh, camaraderie in which we were all experiencing all of those different spaces together uh, and growing from them. Unfortunately, we all ended up on different paths, but in that beginning, it was all of us that were getting kicked out of the schools and all three of us did spend some time in jail. Um, there was a lot of that in Memphis, Tennessee, and unfortunately there still is. Uh, short stint I've been here, it's, it's here as well. It's across the country uh, for young people of color from stigmatized groups. Um, and fortunately, uh, after 10th grade, I was invited to attend an elite prep school on an island off the coast of Rhode Island. Um, I went there, took some classes, excelled, and so then they offered me a full scholarship to go there for the rest of high school. Uh, so I did, uh, again, going to a completely different world where it was mostly international students and I don't know how to put it. The, the school was on an island off the coast of Rhode Island with its own beach, chefs, the, the whole thing. 
it was a great experience and it taught me a lot uh, and also instilled a motivation in me because I never lost sight of my brothers or all of the people back in Memphis, Tennessee that uh, I had grown to love. Um, from there, I uh, matriculated to uh, Northwestern University uh, to study biomedical engineering. I should have mentioned my father is born and raised in Nigeria. And as a child of a Nigerian, I had two choices in college. I was to be an engineer or to be a doctor. Um, <laughs> and just like he would want, I found a way to bring both of those together uh, initially. Uh, after taking organic chemistry and my life changing due to it, um, I really started to think, um, I love engineering, I love numbers, I love the application of numbers and science. Um, however, what was really important to me was the story behind me. Uh, all that I had experienced when I was in Memphis, all that I experienced since I left Memphis on to Chicago. Um, and so I switched majors to psychology, African-American studies and economics uh, with the interest in, well, I was, I was pretty idealistic at the time. Like, if there's problems with education, why don't we just fix it? If we know the numbers well enough, we should be able to apply those numbers and just fix the problem. Uh, it wasn't until grad school that I understood that it, nothing's that easy. Um, and indeed, uh, I wanted to find that out. And so after uh, graduating, I stayed in Chicago to uh, work on a project that looked at the psychological repercussions of juvenile uh, incarceration um, and then uh, accepted an offer to uh, get my master's and PhD at Stanford in the psychology department. Uh, I, I had, was initially given the offer by Claude Steele, uh, which <laughs> the whole story in and of itself that I've been chasing this guy my whole career. He was here, you know, as the uh, <laughs> vice chancellor when I started here and then he left again. Um, but we joke about it. We're, we're good friends. Um, but it was then that I realized that, no, it would take a lot of work and that there were many, many very serious factors involved in why things are the way they currently are. Um, and just with that story, I think it can make more sense that then where this work is, fortunately, is that we are able to produce some real world mitigations and in inequity in a science based way and in a replicable way. Um, the overall theory is an idea of, well, there's a lot of industry use of things like diversity, equity, and inclusion training. We've heard of implicit bias trainings and things of this nature, and they're good intentions. However, what people may not be aware of, that scientists may not have done the best job of letting people know is that those often aren't very effective. If they are effective, those effects are often short-lived. The way people felt comes back as they are then exposed to more sources of those biases. And it also can backfire. People don't like feeling like people are pointing at them and calling them racist or sexist, things of that nature. And that these are realities of the baseline, what we're dealing with. And the, the theory is that what if we can sideline that whole, all of the barriers or challenges that come with that and elevate people's context-based goals. And so I don't like to talk in jargon, essentially elevate why people do what they do in the first place as it pertains to their profession, for example. Um, and if we can do that in a very targeted way, maybe that can render bias dysfunctional, that it actually gets in the way of them doing what they seek to get out of their job or their career, things of that nature. Fortunately, we, 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 we have evidence uh, that that can work. Uh, and so quickly through some targeted interventions and what I mean is large scale randomized controlled trials, the same type of experimentation that allows us to know if a vaccine works or not. Um, applied or, or I worked with uh, one of the 10 largest cities in the country with all of the probation and parole officers in the city. Uh, it was about 250 of them that served approximately 20,000 people on probation or parole. And through a targeted intervention to elevate their context-based goals about empathy of why they 
became those type of officers in the first place, how they wanted to help people get back on their feet, how they wanted to help their communities. Um, over the course of a year, it mitigated recidivism rates as well as violations to the terms of people's uh, uh, sentencing. Um, recidivism is a very difficult thing to mitigate. And so I joke with my colleagues that I feel like I can retire now, but I haven't gotten tenure yet. <laughs> but they know I'm joking, but I, I couldn't imagine being able to uh, produce such a thing in a very uh, specific and strategic way that it can be replicated. Um, also, uh, along with this theory, uh, worked with colleagues at Stanford uh, to here in Alameda County in the juvenile detention or juvenile justice center, as well as Oakland Unified School District, looking at a potential intervention to uh, mitigate the extent to which children leaving juvenile detention end up back in juvenile detention. And what we found to be the key way to do that is speaking with the youth as they are released, finding out what their interests and goals are, putting that in a very strategic and, 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 and rich letter that, that that we then delivered to one of their teachers of their choosing, choosing at the school where they return. And that just by doing that, it could spark a relationship that could set a whole process in motion where those children indeed became over 60% less likely to be to go back to prison or to uh, uh, be kicked out of school or referred to the office for disciplinary action. Again, very real world outcome um, and a difficult one, historically a difficult one to have movement on and definitely not in a sustained way. And then finally, um, a project that Professor Smalls mentioned, I. Uh, this one has more of a story to it, but I'll, I'll be brief. Initially ran a study across three school districts here in the Bay Area, looking at teacher-student relationships. Uh, as you may know, uh, black and brown students face a heightened risk of being kicked out of school by way of suspensions. Um, the intervention was geared towards helping teachers to see the humanity in children, to elevate their context-based goals, uh, their professional goals of helping children learn and grow and become their best possible selves. And that cut suspension rates by 50% across that sample of about 2,000 students. When that happened, it was published by the National Academy of Sciences, which was picked up by uh, the Obama administration and the US Department of Education recommended it as the number one way to combat discipline problems uh, for districts across the country. With that came districts that were interested in this type of approach. And I chose to work with uh, the one of the largest districts that reached out um, to look at just this thing that we, we tested, can it replicate and can it replicate in a much larger sample on the other side of the country? And so this is a Southern state uh, and a school district, one of the 10 largest school districts It serves about 125,000 students. Um, and so we applied the same type of approach. And this time we were able to learn quite a bit more. First of all, it did replicate. Uh, we found the same efficacy, the same mitigation of suspension rates. However, I failed to mention, but as you may know about the Bay Area, that first test, most of the students uh, were Latinx, Latino, Latina, uh, or Asian, or Asian American. Um, in the South, most of the students are black or white. Um, and so that type of diversity on the sample, we were able to determine, can this actually cut gaps in suspension rates? And indeed, it cut the uh, racial disparity by 45% uh, for Black and, uh, they use the term Hispanic there, Black and Hispanic students. Um, and that we were also able to follow it in an additional year and saw that those effects persisted into a subsequent year when those students didn't even have that teacher anymore. And so it's something that they took with them uh, and continue to benefit them. It also mitigated disparity rates based on students' history of suspensions. And uh, it, pretty much did away with disparities due to uh, ability status or eligibility for special education. And so I'm really proud of these findings. Uh, and I was just joking, we are going to continue this work. I'm very happy to do that work here at Berkeley where there is a common mission that we are not just scientists off in an ivory tower, but we are a part of our communities. 
I will continue to work with Alameda County, San Francisco, Sacramento, and actually a number of districts in California now, uh, working with the juvenile detention centers. I am now the president of a national law firm that advocates for youth. They were the ones you saw in the news that were taking cases to the Supreme Court uh, on behalf of the children in cages on the Mexico border. Um, I feel inspired by my students, undergrads, graduates, post -backs, all of them. Uh, and yeah, just thank you. Thanks for sharing your work and your background and your ongoing uh, studies, Jason. We appreciate it uh, very much and congratulations once again. Uh, the final award, now I'm delighted to announce an honorable mention for the Yamashita Prize uh, to Nazanin uh, Kandahari. Uh, Nazanin is unable to be with us today, but I want to say a few words about her and about the award. She was nominated by Susan Ivey, who is a physician and a faculty member here in public health here on campus. Nazanin is a medical student at the UCSF School of Medicine in the program in medical education for urban undeserved and recently completed her Masters of Science through the joint medical program here at Berkeley. Nazanin is an Afghan asylum seeker and the founder of the Afghan Clinic, a research and health education initiative dedicated to both addressing the needs and nurturing the strengths of the Afghan people. She organizes health education forums and support groups for Afghan refugees. In addition, Nazanin is the committed researcher. She's conducted extensive clinical and health disparities research, including a community-based initiative to promote cancer screening amongst the Latinx community. And she's also volunteered for human rights clinics, where she helps to conduct forensic medical evaluations. As a medical student, as I mentioned, she has a very busy schedule and unfortunately could not be with us today. So congratulations to Nazanin, and we'll make sure that she gets a certificate and her award. I'm not so sure about the flowers. We'll look into that and we'll try our best. Can you join me in, in congratulating Nazanin? So thank you to the, uh, the Yamashita Prize nominators and congratulations to Jason and Nazanin. Now we have some time for discussion. And so I invite Jordan, Yadira and Jason to come and have a seat in the front here. And those of you in the room who have any questions, please raise your hand. And that includes the honorees. You may have questions for one another. Okay. And if you're on Zoom, please use, please use the question and answer, uh, and answer feature and we'll try to take all your questions. So please come and take a seat in the front. Okay, before we take the first question, does anyone have any comments they'd like to make or are you happy to take questions? Yeah. Okay, I have a couple of questions myself, but I'll wait for folks first. Um, how are we dealing with the questions on Zoom? You're going to bring them to me. Okay, great. Right. It's like a television show. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let me ask this question if I can figure it out. So uh, the person would like to know, oh, it's Omawali Fowles. Yes, I know Omawali. She'd like to know who has written studies on incidences of racial discrimination against black women instructors in K-12 and or against black women professors at the community college level or at the university level um, by students. Okay, is that discriminate, racial discrimination? Oh yeah, against black women instructors by students. Are we aware of any studies like that that are focused on discrimination by students? I have not come across any, no. any research on that no no anyone yeah i'm i'm not familiar we we hear we hear a lot of stories from our colleagues and from students of discrimination gender discrimination in general uh, not treating uh, women uh, or by uh, or uh, non gender non binary professors with the same respect that they treat men uh, but i'm not familiar with any research on that it's certainly something we there's can no think research, about but there's that a lot there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, and it's the kind of thing you hear at conferences. Um, yeah, where there's just there's just a, you know often a disrespect, a, a, a challenging of the authority of the knowledge of the expertise, yeah, and this is a common uh, 
anecdotally it's common across the country and almost certainly uh, research exists. We, we may want to consult with our colleagues in the School of Education. Uh, thanks for that question. Any, any other questions? Okay, yeah, well, you take it down. Well, let me, let me begin. Any, anyone else? Let me begin with one of my questions. So what I'd like to know from, from each of you is in the path to this level of success, can you tell us what some of the challenges were that you faced, that you felt personally, uh, some of the challenges and, and how you overcame these challenges? Anything come to mind? Or was it all easy? <laughs> I can't believe it was all easy. Um, I can start off. Yeah, please um, go ahead. I think uh, four years ago when I stepped foot onto this campus, um, I was bombarded by the advice to find my community and to find my people and that doing that would open doors and make it the best four years, you know, of my life. And I found that very difficult. Um, it was very, very few people that I would meet that were from very similar um, backgrounds with me, um, especially, um, you know, where I'm from, the Central Valley. There's very few students that ever reach Sather Gate or places like that. Um, and for me, those were the people that I felt most connected to and that I could feel were my community because they were folks from back home who understood, you know, what it was like to grow up in a, in a rural community and, and be one of the few, you know, folks of color in some of our high school classes. Um, and so that for me was a huge challenge and overcoming that was being part and joining Central Valley Scholars, which is the organization that um, helped launch um, the mentorship program and it was it was just I just remember it was meeting I think there was five of us and we just met in a room and talked for hours and it was just so natural our connection and our ability to connect with one another and our stories and, and how we got to UC Berkeley um, and we wanted to share that with folks who shared the same dreams of, of reaching higher education and continuing their education. And so that was one of the biggest challenges is just finding that community. And then, you know, once a few, a few of the folks from the beginning graduated and then there was a pandemic and so community shifted and it couldn't be in person anymore. And we had to find community, you know, through Zoom and, and trying to navigate you know, a pandemic, which I would have never ever imagined would have happened when I did get here four years ago. So, you know, that was also a challenge in and of itself is just finding ways to connect with folks and make sure that we were filling in the gaps that not only we had experienced, but also maybe things we hadn't experienced and making sure that we were listening to students and making, you know, making their needs our priority instead of what we thought their needs could be. Mm. Okay, thank you. Well, I can just hop in there. Um, I think for me, when starting Long Beach City Votes, the hardest part was finding expertise. And when you're working on campaigns, I think there's you know, a greater recognition of you know, voting strategies, of the importance of them. And usually with older voting audiences, you, you kind of know what messaging works um, just because the turnout rate is, is much higher with older groups. And so with young people, there's just this, you know, problem that everybody recognizes, but you just don't know exactly how to approach the problem. Um, and especially even working on the Biden presidential campaign, you had campaign veterans, even from um, Obama eras, who were super great in mobilizing older groups. But even among those people who you would think, you know, are experts, um, still had trouble there. And so when I was starting Long Beach City Votes, I had this organizational acumen. I'd done organize, organizing work, um, but I just wasn't sure exactly like what messaging would work. So there was lots of uncertainty there. Um, and you know, it's good and bad. You know, it makes you work harder and, and, and harder to find those solutions. But at the end of the day, you're also kind of worried that maybe, you know, I can't do this, or um, you just don't know how to overcome that um, you know, obstacle, especially when you're starting a new venture. 
Um, so that was the problem that I faced. And, uh, you know, just recognizing that I had a community um, at those high schools where you have professors, I mean, excuse me, not professors, but teachers who are working with students um, and younger groups, I felt like I could tap into that expertise. Um, so I would maybe just give anyone advice, like if you're uncertain about something, how to go along, um, you know, with a certain strategy, just try to rely or almost find a community with the people that you think um, would know. And it's okay to ask for help and to just explore those solutions and see where that takes you. That's great. Um, <laughs> um, I would say uh, for me, the an ongoing challenge is, I guess, ironically, the essence of Sankofa. That meaning the idea of flying forward while looking backward. It's usually used as uh, an idea of you know what we should do, it's something that's important to do, which I agree with. And yet, in life, I, I found that it's very challenging to do, or, or at least it has been for me, um, because my world has become just so stretched apart over time and space um, and opportunity. Um, it's, it's, it has its challenges, but it's also very much an asset. So the challenge is that I don't, what well, number of things, like where, where do I belong? Belonging uncertainty, uh, from going from, Memphis, Tennessee, to Rhode Island, to Chicago, to California. Um, all of those are now my homes and yet none of them are fully because it's so scattered. But then also the people I grew up with in Memphis, Tennessee, a lot of them have been watching them be slain, be incarcerated, get out, go back in. Um, a lot of things that do not look like what my life has looked like at all. Um, and as I've gone through life, it's being surrounded by politicians and the powers of industry and being on boards with tech giants, it's, it's, it can be difficult to fly forward while looking backward, but I think it is critical to do so. And I try to apply that in my work. Um, yeah, I would say that was the biggest challenge for me, but I think that that's probably something faced by a lot of people that go off to college or to grad school. It can come off, it can feel like one is being selfish. Like I'm thinking of me when in reality, I could be back home doing more for my family, doing more for my community. Um, and yeah, I'll just admit it, it's a challenge that, uh, uh, one has to keep up with, but uh, if I can offer anything, I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, a light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, yes, See it is the light, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the light at the end of the table. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for that. We have another question from online. I'm not sure who it's for particularly. Let's see. So the, uh, the question asks, were there any nutritional adjustments that were made amongst the students who had been in juvenile detention facilities? Specifically, the question it is asking is referring to efforts to reduce or eliminate sugary beverages and energy drinks because they have tons of sh sugar in them and they strip the essential B vitamins, B vitamins from the central nervous system, hampering learning and exacerbating irritability due to vitamin B deficiencies. Is that a question that is seen for you, Jason? I'm not sure. In my work, I work directly with the youth themselves. Yeah. And so I th that probably wouldn't be something that they would be speaking mm -hmm. on. Um, so is that I, something that comes up at all in your way? Uh, healthy not. diet has something that affects. It does more so in the schooling. Yeah. And how I mean, when I was a when I was in K through twelve, there was like a fruitopia machine in the school, um, and those don't you won't find those anymore. But that okay. yes, in social psychology. And in a number of fields, it's okay. very clear that like that affects development. Okay. And then Jordan and Yudira, um, uh, uh, you know, as uh, in your experiences, what we read is that the younger people are subjected more and more to these kind of enticing sugary drinks. Is this something that comes up at all in any of your, in any of your discussions or is that not a primary issue? 
I know for older folks like me, I've got to watch what sugar I take in. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's got to fight. Yeah, it's, it's uh, older folks and black folks uh, issue. Okay, no? Um, any other questions? I have another couple of questions. Okay. Here's one of my questions. Uh, you all had impressions of what Berkeley was like before you arrived here. I did too. I came from England. And then you have your experiences of Berkeley. Without incriminating yourselves, <laughs> can you tell us how things changed, what you expected it would be like? You can incriminate yourselves if you want. I'm not here to tell you what to do. But how, what were your impressions of Berkeley before you came? And, and how did they change? Or maybe they didn't change? Go ahead, I mean, John. Yeah, I can start this one. Yeah, um, you know, I came in knowing what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to study political science. Um, in high school, I got involved. Um, I was in like a government con criminal justice concentration. So for me, Berkeley just seemed like the next logical step. Um, I don't think I had like impressions maybe about the community or the campus. I just thought political science. There's some great professors here. I'll have a great, you know, I'll receive a great education here. Um, and then as I started taking classes, I realized that most of my government classes, um, like sure we, you know, went into the textbook and we talked about a lot of these great concepts, but I didn't realize how much Berkeley was invested in community um, and multicultural communities and serving them. So most of your political lessons were about, you know, greater social issues that are going around um, locally you know, around Berkeley and like nationally. So I thought that that was really refreshing. It wasn't so textbook heavy as I thought. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like most of the lessons that I learned were like directly applicable to communities here. Um, and I really appreciated that. Um, in terms of people, um, I've heard great things about people. So I, I didn't have any like bad impressions coming here, but I met some really good friends and some really inspiring people. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the political science department would like to, to have you promote them. I'm sure they will. We'll send the video to them. Make sure they pay you. Um, uh, Jason? I will incriminate myself and then save myself. <laughs> I went to college in Chicago, and our rivalry was with another college. I mean, another, yeah, another college in uh, Chicago. So I do nothing about the big game or any of those things. Went to grad school at Stanford, so what I heard <laughs> was stuff that comes with a rivalry. And yeah, we're not supposed to say that name, you know. But then let me catch myself. The most recent time I was there, my partner and I uh, went down there. Oh, I shouldn't say this for either. I, I'm currently a director. <laughs> I'm currently a director <laughs> at Stanford. And with that, you get uh, tickets to games. Uh, was asked which game I wanted to go to. I said, I want to go to the big game. Um, it's in the skybox. <laughs> you all might know where this is going if you kept up with football season last year. But we decided to go wearing Berkeley clothes uh, oh. in the skybox. All the alumni, donors, everyone. Um, and Berkeley destroyed them. I'm sorry, this is the football game. And then stormed the field at Stanford. And so we ran. Uh, <laughs> with all our Berkeley stuff on, but uh, so I saved myself. But in reality, something that's really impressed me since I've been here is really meeting some of these students here. The idea of upward mobility realized is incredible to me and really inspires me for what I wish my brothers could have had more of. Like some of my students were straight out of incarceration and wanted to get back on their path and went through a junior college or a community college and transferred in for like really just doing what it took and having the grits or, or initiative to make it happen. And then you get in office hours with them and they are above and beyond the class and thinking, 10 years in advance and really speaking to experiences that can inform social change has been very impressive. And I don't know if that would be at this, this level anywhere else in the world. Is a joke for you too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, promotional video, it's wonderful. You hear it? 
what is it? Yeah, mine might not be so much of a promotional <laughs> video. <laughs> Vicky encourages us to be critical, right? That's and introspective. That's so, true. Yeah. Um, as I'm a first generation student, uh, my older brother, um, he was a few years older than me and he went to college first, um, but he went to college in Wisconsin, which is very random. And my parents didn't even know where Wisconsin was. <laughs> um, so when I made the decision to apply and come here uh, to Berkeley, my parents were stoked that it was, you know, it's two hours from home. They could drive up here anytime. Um, they didn't really know about the, the, the name that is UC Berkeley until I remember they would wear cow gear everywhere <laughs> for a few months and people would come up to them and tell them like, oh, like, how do you know Berkeley? Like, what's your connection? And my dad would be like, oh, my daughter goes there. And they would just, you know, say, wow, that's a huge accomplishment. So little by little, they got to, to see and understand, you know, the big significance of this place and of, of me getting here. Um, for folks who don't know, the Central Valley is a very conservative um, place and region. Um, and so I heard a lot about UC Berkeley and about how liberal it was and the protests and that there were things like women and gender studies majors and ethnic studies majors, which I actually became one. <laughs> um, and my, my teachers painted it as a place that, you know, would shape me to become a certain kind of person. And to me, it was, it was rather negative. Um, and then I came onto campus and we had a few, you know, events of um, groups on campus inviting certain speakers to come. And I kind of had to face the reality that while it may have certain histories that, you know, do align with more liberal policies and ideas, you know, it's also a college campus where students from all over the place with all kinds of ideas and opinions um, come to learn together in these classrooms. And so that was something that I had to face pretty early on. Um, I did feel pretty alone coming here, you know, being just first generation too. I, I, don't, I didn't know what college would be like. I didn't know what the process was like. Uh, it kind of felt like I was walking, you know, blindfolded at every step of the way. Um, and with that being said, I did find a lot of spaces to learn and to grow and to even challenge some of the things and ideas that I came in here with. And that was in my political science classes. I ended up taking an ethnic studies class that just changed my life. Um, it was with Professor Nikki Jones. Um, so that's my colleague in my department. Yes, um, that class. Currently chair of the department. Yes, it was a criminal, uh, criminal justice class in the community. And that class just, it, fundamentally changed my trajectory here at UC Berkeley and I, I you know went in as an ethnic studies major I decided I could try and tackle both majors and I think doing that really taught me and showed me the different aspects of what UC Berkeley can be and all the things that you can learn here and so while it was it was difficult to navigate um, you know I, I really can't believe I've, I've made it to the end here of graduating <laughs> this weekend <laughs> Experience is challenging, but I think that's what college should be. It should challenge you, it should challenge your ideas, and it should provide the space for you to learn, to grow, um, to maybe unlearn some of the things that you come in here with and come out a, a completely different person. And I can say that UC Berkeley definitely did that for me. That's fantastic. I'll say a footnote to that. One mm -hmm. of our Marshall Prize former award winners, Sarah Ramirez, Stanford PhD, and when she went, when she was giving her talk, she basically broke down and said, I, because she went back to Central Valley, and she said, everybody told her she had to do it by Stanford PhD. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that was what all that. Yeah. So yeah. everybody told her what? That she, she was wasting her PhD oh, she, yeah, yeah. by going back to Just, Central Valley. Yeah, that's what they said. You know? We go, okay. Before, uh, and didn't you do a course with a professor in African American studies that you truly love? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's okay, you don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 No, but she, I don't remember, I don't recall. She, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We have another question here, thanks. Um, so I have a question for Jordan and Yadira. 
Maybe the question that graduating seniors are tired of hearing or don't like to hear, but you're both so poised that I feel like you can handle it. Yeah, um, I'd love to hear what, what's next to you and um, what your goals are, but I also want to say that it's okay not to be sure, and it's okay to do a bunch of different things along the way, and so, but whatever you want to share about what your plans and goals are would be great. <laughs> Yeah, so I, um, I'm actually continuing my work with Central Valley Scholars. We were lucky enough to receive um, an incredible amount of funding after a really long period of applying to so many grants that I didn't ever want to look at another grant application again. And so we were providing for the first year, um, you know, positions that would be fully paid, which is incredible work. Um, you know, the folks who started this organization were all under the age of like 22, all of us, and we were all, um, we're all now UC Berkeley graduates, which is also really cool. I'm the last one to graduate. Um, so it's really great to move and grow along with the organization. So I'll be uh, working with them for um, a year. It's in my plans to apply to get a master's in public policy. I would love to do that here at the Goldman School. Um, we'll just have to see um, what comes next, but uh, that's my trajectory trajectory for the next few months and year. Um, after my master's, I really would like to continue in educational policy in the Central Valley. Um, that's just where my heart's at, and it's, you know, I just, um, it just changed my life to be able to come to UC Berkeley, and so I want to you know, grow alongside others, and, and for students who see themselves coming to institutions like these, I would like to just support them in whatever ways we can. Um, um, and as for me, I plan on um, attending graduate school after graduation, um, but I am planning on taking a gap year in between. Um, I ideally want to go to law school and study civil rights law. Um, but with that being said, I really like the idea of spending a year before law school and helping young people find their voices. Um, and you know, to help to their fundamental right of theirs, that's the right to vote. Um, so I will be doing that after graduation. Um, and so that means returning back to Long Beach City, which is where this initiative was founded, um, and working on piloting a civics education course and creating content for high school youth, um, voting content for high school youth. Jason, what's next for you? Oh, yes, Tanya. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, yes. That's it. Okay. I think we have time for one last question. Please go ahead. I have two questions. One for congratulations to all of you. And I want to say, basically, when you came here to Berkeley and people told you, uh, Found the people that were like, um, what was your first reaction when you didn't know what this play was composed of any place? And you have a clue how to find people like you, you know, because obviously that's a big, a big problem when a student, minority student gets here, you know, find those people here. What people? And, and I wanted to know about this. And this is Jason, thank you very much. I, as a having students of with so if people, uh, you know, government people recovering, and I work before graduate in representation centers, uh, this is something that is important that those, those uh, teenagers, those people, you can say they are advanced, you know. And for me, because they continue to be, you know, every time, you know, it's a, it's a machine process. And every time, more and more people that are in there, that juvenile detention, you know, and they continue to ask questions and more questions. It looks like a more advanced. Don't you think it's time for the old psychology team to change the method of listening in another way? Did you want to go? 
Do you want to go first? <laughs> yes, yes. I think that's question. Yes. Um, so yeah, that was one of my biggest frustrations is hearing from my orientation leaders and my RA and professors, you know, the term find your community. Um, and I would always think to myself, well, how do I find my community? You know, in a place as big as UC Berkeley, I felt like a fish in the sea sometimes. Walking down Sather Gate, um, it just is overwhelming um, sometimes to think about the amount of students who come here. Um, and so I think for me, I really defined my community once I started taking classes that really spoke to me in my experience. And I, I can really say that that was just exacerbated in the ethnic studies department um, and taking classes with professors like um, Dr. Nikki Jones and Professor Pablo Gonzalez. They really opened up spaces for students to talk with each other in the classroom and to build community and relationships. And that was something that you don't always get in those lecture halls that are like 500 students or even more. And so I really appreciated the community that I found in the ethnic studies department and program. Um, spaces like the MCC, the Multicultural Center, that was like my second home. Um, I mean, even right now during finals, they provide lunch for students who are studying and they have an abundance of resources and you can just walk in there and tell that folks will take you in and we'll talk to you and we'll get to know you. and it's a community that cares for you outside of your, you know, position and title as a student. And that's really what I was looking for is that, you know, I am a student at UC Berkeley, but I'm also, um, you know, a person who needs friendships and I, you know, take a lot of, of responsibility back home as well. And so I wanted to find that community that, that saw me as who I was outside of being a student. And I really did find that in those classes and in centers like the MCC. Um, that took me in and, and just really, you know, allowed me to learn and grow um, and to flourish at a place like UC Berkeley. And so my biggest advice would be to sometimes push your boundaries and, and, and take that uncomfortable step and maybe join that, you know, that group on campus that you're really interested in, uh, but you don't know what it's about. You can, you know, you can always say that you at least tried it and you at least checked it out to see what it was like. Um, I remember being really scared the first time I like walked into different, you know, spaces on campus, but they ended up becoming like my second home here. So I think sometimes the, the hardest part is to get over that initial fear. Um, but, you know, also that fear is really valid when you are on a campus like UC Berkeley. Um, sometimes it doesn't feel like it. That's also something I found students wouldn't really talk about is that fear of, you know, pushing your boundaries and stepping outside of your comfortable um, your comfortability, but I think that that was something that pushed me and, and really helped me to, to find those spaces and those community um, centers here on campus. Thank you for asking such an important question. I think the topic about matriculation for students of color is such an important one, and I'm not sure if it's talked about so frequently. Um, but I think for me, the way I approached Berkeley is I actually felt really comfortable to turn to like Black People um, Association, or um, even the Black Recruitment and Retention Center. Um, when I first got accepted into Berkeley, I received an email from the Black Recruitment and Retention Center, and I was invited to, her, to an orientation. Um, and so there I met other um, students of color who looked like me, and even um, older, like third year, fourth year students um, of color were able to say, well, these are really great communities to join. Um, so having those initial referrals were super, super helpful to me, um, for me. And then once I started taking classes around um, certain interests, um, kind of as, what, as to what she spoke to, I think that really helped because I kind of understood like, well, this is what I'm really interested in. And also these people that I'm taking these classes with, they have also the same interests as me. So study groups or even um, extracurriculars that were around those interests. Um, I was able to like join and connect with um, and that's really the way I approached it. I don't think I had some type of manual, um, you know, the referrals helped. I also tried reaching out to older students. Um, so if there were students like maybe in a grad program that I wanted to get into or maybe part of some type of like job or internship or even community group, I, you know, I reached out. Um, and I had the confidence to do that because again of those referrals of people telling me that maybe you should talk to this person. 
Um, so finding community in that sense is really easy for me. Um, and also to having referrals and people saying, these are really good classes you should take if you're interested in these topics. Um, I think that really helped. Um, like, I don't think there's an instructional, you know, manual for students of color, of, you know, how to navigate um, a predominantly white institution, but just having those few groups and those few people um, and even professors who would who would kind of take you underneath their wing and, and make those suggestions, uh, you know, both professors of color and, you know, non-colored professors, that was really helpful too. Those things are backed by science. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, the uh, question you asked me was about juvenile, or, yeah, juvenile incarceration, school to prison pipeline type of thing. And the question was if we should do away with it. No, oh. uh, no, really. Uh, what I was, what I was, uh, yeah, basically was commenting about the the initial advance of those guys that that the patients were in trouble all, all, you know. They get in trouble, they get it to another thing, and they, every time they are more than spent, and of course they get, I mean, yeah, they get bored in the class and they continue hacking out because the institution doesn't get, doesn't give them the answers they want to hear, or mm -hmm. the framework they want to stay. And what I was saying is that if it's not time for, Changing the, the situation, not the situation, you know, because what I hear is help the students, help those, those guys, those, those children, behaviors in trouble, you know, make them to see, to, to see what they were told, uh, see, to be, to see a teacher in front of them, but the responsibility ultimately the responsibility then you know for the system that create a condition for those guys to be in that trap. And what I say is probably the problem is the education, the system, and if you think it's way to change, or the using the content at the beginning of your talk. The um So, so yes, I, I didn't go too much into my research, but it very much uh, the findings are based on the idea that it advances over time. It escalates uh, sharply and that the real disparity that we see is not in just uh, this group who's getting this rate or in that group's getting this rate. It's that the black and brown are number of stigmatized or students from stigmatized groups, um, their rate of being disciplined or arrested or put in jail and things of that uh, nature, it escalates at a much sharper rate um, than other groups. Um, and it comes with those ideas of like, once you have a, a record that you're a statistic and that you're treated as such, um, and that that compounds on uh, structural factors that were already in place, such that their communities may have been heavily policed, uh, not receiving resources vital to their healthy development, um, that all these things work together in a way that it makes it makes it sad. Um, I absolutely think that there will need to be systemic changes. I do not have the specialization to do it, but that's why I try to work with the people that do. And the National Center for Youth Law very much has a whole arm that looks at uh, juvenile uh, justice uh, in the school to prison pipeline. Um, also, there is a lot of work looking at the solution is in the kids themselves, that we just need to get them to act better. We just need to get them to not be bad. Um, well, because I'm a scientist, to be true to the, the, the numbers, there is some level of uh, efficacy there, that, that that type of approach can help. However, it's very much the case that that's not going to do the whole trick. It's about what's going on around the child. Uh, my culture, Nigerian culture and Southern culture, the village raises the child. And it, it very much makes a difference. Um, and these are reasons why I specialize in the exact thing that I do. Um, and that's not making, not, not specializing in policy or policy level changes, but 
in the relationships uh, that these children have, the, the teachers that they have, the administrators, the principals that they have, the, the officers, uh, the probation officers, the people that interact with these youth. Um, how are you interacting with them? How are you responding to them? And the key that I'm finding across these contexts is empathy, the extent to which they can truly, truly think from that child's perspective. Remember back when they were a kid and how they just, everyone that's a kid does things sometimes. They throw paper, they pass notes in class. They, that's what make, that's a part of being a kid. You're learning, um, you're exploring, and, and, and that's to be expected. And seeing that, that them too, um, and seeing that their behavior is not an indictment of their character. It's things like puberty. It's things like the, of course they don't want to sit still in a classroom for an hour and then go to another one and sit still for an hour. Um, and so thinking about the things, the situation around the child uh, as well, um, absolutely think that there's a lot of room for, or need for a psychological approach to curb the escalation part, but even psychology isn't gonna be able to do it on its own. There'll be a strategic integration of sociology, psychology, education, law, uh, these young people <laughs> and all that well, they're about to do. Yeah, um, okay. yeah. yeah we, we've run over time. Oh. Uh, thanks for your, your presentation. Uh, sometimes there are adults who don't like to sit still. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we do have some more moments, so I, I do wanna bring it to a close. Uh, and thank you very much. But, but very briefly, when I arrived here in 1984 from England, and I thought I might find a community, a lot of these things are quite gendered. It was very difficult to find someone else who was first generation as I am, uh, and black and mixed from Liverpool. But one of the things I expected at Berkeley is that I would be accepted. Uh, and it was very difficult, because when I started to speak, people would just laugh out loud at my accent. It's a joke, it's okay. And I said, what's going on? And some people said, we can't understand the word that you're saying. Other people said, well, it's so interesting. And some people said, well, you just sound like Ringo Starr. We can't take it seriously. Okay. However, I've now been here more or less for 37 years and they haven't forced me to integrate. And I still sound like I'm fresh off the boat. So I feel like I'm accepted here. Let me bring it to a close. Okay. I am FOB, I understand that. I understand that. I'm trying my best. I say elevator. I don't say lift. Okay, so thank you again to David Kerr, to Bob, and to the Yamashita family, and to the nominators for the Yamashita Prize. Final congratulations to Jordan, to Yadira, to Jason, and to Nazanin. Thank you. Thank you.